Welcome to those of you who will be watching this video, Leadership in Crisis Time. It is the first of a mini series to invite special colleagues and friends of mine who have something relevant to say in time like this. And I encourage them to share their reflection with you. I am Mayan Chung Judge, the Director of Quality and Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. Our guests today are two remarkable women, Penny Lawrence and Penelope Brooke, who have done amazing things around the world. They will introduce themselves to you before they share their discussion around four questions. And may I turn the time over to them. Please enjoy. My name is Penelope Brook. Um, after quite a number of years at the World Bank, um, including roles, for example, leading the World Bank's relationship with Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay, and then as World Bank Ombudsman, most recently I was the inaugural director for the Atlantic Institute in Oxford, which brings together an amazing community of leaders for social change, a very diverse and committed community. And I'm Penny Lawrence. Um, I was, until a couple of years ago, Deputy Chief Executive at Oxfam uh, GB and was the crisis director for Oxfam. So that involved leading on humanitarian crises, but also leading on management crises. Um, and, you know, combining big operational jobs, I have learned so much from May Ann and the OD community around uh, combining really an OD approach um, uh, with my leadership, whether in crisis or or not. The thing to remember is that you are who you are. You need to be your authentic self, but the situation has changed. So it requires you to adapt. And um, I think in a crisis, things tend to get amplified in a way that you're sometimes um, uh, not aware of. So if you have um, an organizational trait that is already, you've got lots of feedback that you need to listen more to staff, you need to do that even more in a, in a, in a crisis. Um, I think the thing I would say that um, I've certainly valued doing is when after the initial frantic days, um, somebody reminds you to breathe <laughs> and actually to take a moment to really step back and reflect on, are we doing the thing right as well as the right things? And are there actually opportunities that I'm not looking at at the moment because I can't only see today or the next few hours rather than the next few weeks and um, coming months? Penelope, what about you? I, I very much agree, Penny. I think you, know, you start where you are. You start with the organization that you've worked hard to build and help grow. And you start in the place you are in your own leadership journey. This is not a moment for councils of perfection and leadership. It's a time for very pragmatically thinking, where am I strong? Um, where am I not so strong? Where are the strengths in my team that it's even more important that I empower and mobilize? at a time that is tough for everyone. Um, and I think like you, a matter of giving yourself time to reflect on where are my strengths normally? How do I make sure I'm using those? Where do I struggle a bit more? How am I doing on mitigating that? Also being conscious under stress, what do I tend to gravitate towards? Do I get a little bit more micromanagey? Do I revert to feeling I have to solve everything because I'm in a position of formal leadership? Having a buddy who helps talk you down from that, having the space to reflect on how do I make sure I'm both sort of staying, staying true and also in my frequent strong urge to make sure everyone's all right and take care of everyone that I'm not actually um, impeding their ability to contribute to challenges that we're trying to understand and solve together. Yeah, I think one of the tendencies is that you look after everybody else and forget to look after yourself as well, isn't it? And um, people, you know, don't just follow what you tell them to. They follow your role model. 
Um, and just remembering that, I think in crisis in particular, if you are able to demonstrate, actually, you know, I'm really tired, I need to take a break, it gives everybody else permission to do this the same, I think. So I, I think that's right, looking after everybody else, but also looking after yourself. I, I found interesting reading some of the commentary on how people react to some very public leaders at this stage and what a positive response there is when a leader they're not saying, gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. They're, they're giving clear direction. They're helping to give meaning. They're helping to give hope. But they're also willing to say, look, there are things I don't know, and there are things that we don't know. Um, and also to, without making people feel insecure, invite collaboration to get answers to those questions. And I think that becomes very, very powerful, because I think if there's one thing that we know about big, complex problems, no one person is going to have a monopoly on understanding how to solve those. So that capacity to mobilize people in the direction of, of positive change is, is even more key. So I think um, the first thing to think is, who do I need around me in order to deal with this particular crisis? Um, Never underestimate the importance of internal communications um, as well as external communications, which is sometimes more obvious to people. So I'd have a core team, which can be your leadership team, but you might want to supplement it with other skills and, and get those people around you. And then that crisis team meets very regularly to start with maybe the beginning of every day. And then after a while, it can meet uh, perhaps uh, once every two days or once a week. So that's the, the start of it. But then at that reflection point, I would look around to see who else has some of the skills that we now need. So you need to keep looking at that in an, in an agile way. And each day, the meeting might start with a check in on how one another is and how um, what voices you're hearing and what you're hearing from your teams. And then it might look like um, a bit of a plan for the day and objectives for the day and who's doing what. And then as time goes on, you can begin to expand that to say, well, what are the objectives for the week or for the month? Or how do those objectives fit with the long-term plans? But it, developing yourself a kind of um, a group of people who you can then agilely add to or perhaps take away and developing a bit of a planning structure, which again, you can use as the basis to expand or to, um, to scale from um, would be my initial suggestions. I, I think at the one, one of one of the core skills in all of this, and I think it's it's both implicit and explicit in what Penny's been talking about, um, is the importance of this of finding ways of listening and hearing. Um, and I think one of the particular strains of the current crisis for for many of us in many countries is the work that Penny is describing is going to be happening at a distance. It's going to be happening over Zoom or Skype um, or uh, some other form of, of virtual communication, which may be also quite new for you. So how are you finding a way of rehearing what is in the room, both in terms of how people are and in terms of what they can add? Um, I think an approach that is is explicitly focused on inclusion in a couple of ways then becomes really important. One is how am I hearing how people are recognizing that people will be in their personal lives experiencing crisis in very different ways. Some suffering great loneliness, some carrying burdens of care that were already heavy and are now amplified. So this, this opportunity to, to really hear that and create an environment that is safe for it while keeping focused on the must do things that, that Penny is rightly orienting us towards. I think a second piece, um, which is challenging but critically important, is finding a way with these more constrained ways of being together and communicating that really brings up people's ideas. Um, and realizing those ideas may come from unexpected places. And there I'd really underline what Penny was saying earlier about thinking about which who needs to be on the team, what kinds of experiences um, need to be there. I was very struck reading a few days ago um, a newsletter by Matt Peary, who created the Sociability app. He said, look, call your friends um, who have um, various kinds of disability to see how they are, but also call them because they are used to dealing um, with isolation 
and with constrained ability to engage in ways with years of practice that may provide something really inspirational and helpful to your efforts. So this kind of thinking who might bring something in that is totally new and different. So this is really a time where all of the work that you've done to create a space in which your teams trust each other, your staff trust each other, and which and in which there is um, a sense of safety about raising ideas that may or may not fly becomes really, really important. And it is hard to sustain that in the virtual space and perhaps to amplify it in the virtual space if it's something that you struggle with in your normal leadership practice. Um, but I think it's a really important piece, um, both for the well-being of your team, but also for, for what you can create together to address the crisis. So building on what Penelope was saying around this listening, not just telling people um, what is happening, which is really important, but actually listening. A very practical way to do that remotely is developing a question and answer open forum. So anybody can send a question in to a particular email address uh, that you can set up during the week. And then once a week, the crisis team actually look at those questions and answer them. And what goes back in uh, that weekly communication to staff is the answers to their questions. It really encourages people to ask questions, um, but your answers will also reassure them that they're being listened to. And at the same time, obviously, you can take a temperature on, is it really the complexities of following or is it um, the fact that their laptop doesn't work or is it actually that they're trying to manage the kids as well as work? What is it that is worrying um, staff? So that's a very practical thing. I think on the planning tool, um, just thinking all the time of three groups of people, not just your staff who are really critically important, of course, but your clients, your customers, your beneficiaries, they need to have a piece of your plan. So if you think of a three by three, you might have clients and customers, you might have staff and you might have the organization and the wider um, sector. And then you might have what we're doing this week, what we're doing going along the horizontal axis, what we're doing in the coming weeks and what, what actually we're doing in the long term. And if you can populate that, you can use it as a planning tool. You can share it with your board and the people that are demanding um, to know what's what's happening very understandably and use it with senior managers to say, you know, what can you contribute to this? But using a basic sort of framework like that, I found extremely helpful. And then in the discussions, um, it's very easy to go to what are the threats and how do we manage the threats? Um, it's uh, perhaps you also need to look at the risks, but you also need to look at the opportunities. If you match what you're looking at now, what's happening with um, COVID-19 for, say, asylum seekers in the UK, a lot of asylum seekers are actually medics, doctors and nurses. And there's an opportunity for um, an idea that was lying around already, which is actually asylum seekers should be allowed to work in the UK. That idea is now gaining a lot of traction within the home office because of the current situation. So if you've got that long term frame, you can sometimes also see opportunities for change, even in, well, especially, actually, I'd say in a crisis. It's a really good question, because in many ways you feel very alive and very relevant. Things are happening so fast that you are having to take very speedy decisions. and actually things that were previously impossible suddenly become possible because everybody's attention is focused on dealing with the crisis. So in many ways, it gives you a lot of energy. And you can see that in the current COVID response with companies pivoting to suddenly make ventilators when they were making F1 cars before. But there's also an exhaustion. There's a kind of waves. Um, and in the exhaustion, maybe the best time to actually take time out and reflect um, and can provide you with uh, renewed, you know, for me, that provided me with a, a sort of renewed sense of direction going forwards. So the Easter break coming up, um, for example, is a great time to actually take some downtime and try and go up a notch and think for the future. So it's kind of exhilarating in a weird way and energizing 
and exhausting uh, at the same time. And then for me, I I was lucky enough to have a lot of training, but I always felt inadequate um, in these times. And I learned to use that inadequacy in service of the organization or the crisis, uh, the client group, the beneficiaries. You know, if it was difficult for me leading the crisis, imagine what it was like for those at the front line of the crisis. And then it kind of pales into insignificance and you do you do the best you can. And the best you can is is often very good. There is that enormous energy that comes from this heightened sense of purpose. I think that in many of these organizations, your relevance has just been enormously amplified, and that is a hugely energizing thing. Um, But there's also, I think, a much, much greater emotional weight um, that the concern for those you're seeking to serve, also your concern for your staff, it becomes a much larger and more complex thing. Um, I I liked what what Penny was saying about inadequacy. I think if you didn't feel inadequate um, in the face of a crisis, there would be something desperately wrong with you. Um, So I, I agree very much with it. This is the time for finding a way of sharing your concerns in ways that don't unsettle everyone and reaching out for help um, and recognizing that um, as you collaborate to figure out what to do and to do it, um, you're also um, reinforcing that positive energy mm-hmm. in those who work with you. Um, but yes, it, it's, it's a, I, I think something which I, I, I've been reflecting on and worrying about sort of in, in the current situation is this is going to go on for a long time. Mm. So how to sustain um, beyond the first two or three weeks where maybe the adrenaline of that exhilaration carries you to a very, you know, a long game. Um, and yeah, so, so I, I, yeah, I think this sort of takes us back to Penny's focus on the planning and the reworking of plans, but also the time, the listening, listening to yourself as well in self-care. The, the importance of being your authentic self as a leader um, and the critical importance of people seeing an alignment between the purpose that you're all working towards and the values that they hold that you hold and they hold with you. Um, and that sense of you being in this with them, that they're not being a disconnect between how you are as a person, how you are as a leader, how you're leading through through the crisis is a critical piece. Having said that, giving yourself a little bit of space. Um, I think Penny earlier mentioned the importance of self-care. I think that most of us who do work that is trying to make the world a better place have a very challenging relationship with taking care of ourselves. Um, We always worry that if we pause to take care of ourselves, we are stopping doing something more important um, in service of others. Um, And I think not only how you give yourself space to reflect, um, space to heal, but also model for your teams the value of that is one really critical piece. Um, And as I said a little bit earlier, this this is not a time for councils of perfection. Um, It's a time for taking all you've already built, um, all of the work that you've put in to being um, a strong, effective, loving Um, leader and thinking about how to nudge that, how to tweak it to deal with what you're facing now. I'd say, yeah, building on what Penelope was saying, really be confident in what you know, but be confident that you won't know all the answers and don't be afraid to ask for help because that includes everybody and allows everybody to, um, to support you in being the leader you want to be. Um, showing direction is important, but really showing empathy and connection um, almost matters matters more. I think also in the um, in the planning of what you're doing, the crisis will have you know um, uh, uh, overloaded your existing plans. Uh, I'm sure, and so. As a leader, you also have to decide what this crisis means you need to stop doing in the medium and longer term, as well as what you need to start doing. 
and again, not being afraid to take some difficult decisions around um, and fine judgments around what the crisis means for, um, if you like, what was previously the regular uh, work. Regularizing the crisis um, might sound a bit of an anathema, but actually that is really important so that people can see the crisis response in relation to their selves and their current work as much as they can see um, their role in, in the short term in managing the crisis. May I, on behalf of everyone, to say thank you to you, Penny and Penelope, for sharing your thoughts and your experience with us on this very relevant topic, which is how to lead in crisis. And I also like to thank you for your willingness to have listeners to contact you directly if they have any issues they like to pursue the conversation. And at the end of this video, you will find both of their LinkedIn profile. May I close with a quote for such challenging time? Life shrinks or expand depends on the proportionality of one's courage. May I wish you courage and peace to navigate through such challenging time. So as they say, stay well, stay courageous and lead from who you are. <laughs>